Hey, it's Vic, and welcome to the masterclass on how to set up your Airtable control center for your business. I'm going to try to run this class in one uninterrupted piece of video, and I'm also going to try to keep it to 60 minutes if possible and to 90 minutes if 60 minutes is just proves to be way too little because this is sort of meant to be an impromptu Im improvisational thing so you can see my thought process around how how I work with Airtable so that you can then copy what makes sense for you and also see how to problem solve within Airtable rather than just giving you sort of a pre-formulated a completely pre-formulated approach. So I might have to cheat in case I, I mess something up. I might have to pause and actually go and figure it out and then come back. But I'm going to try to keep it uninterrupted. And let's just dive right in and create a new base. Now let me just give you a small bit of context. The project or the business that I intend to make this base for is a project that I've been meaning to do for pretty much all my life around my passion which is songwriting and this 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 business is called write awesome songs or at least that's what it's called for now and what i want to do is basically teach people to write how to write songs on their guitar and how to sing and obviously that includes a whole lot of stuff that includes having a website having a blog having a youtube channel getting the right equipment getting a good recording space so i could do everything getting lighting creating courses, creating a membership site, um, you know, recordings. There's so much stuff involved in any kind of business. And hopefully there's enough carryover from what I'm going to be showing in this business to your own business. And if not, of course, you can always ask questions and ask clarification for clarification in the comments. And I can always record new videos to supplement the core, core videos that make up this class to answer very sort of specific questions for your particular situation. So here I am in Airtable, let's create a brand new base and we are going to start from scratch. And of course I will give you as many templates as I can, but in the meantime, just so you, you understand how everything works, we're going to go from scratch. That's really more important than, than starting with a template. So we're gonna call this the Write Awesome Songs Control Center. Now let's give it some kind of a icon, representative icon. How about a rocket ship? And let's launch it. So here's our basic control center. And the very first thing that makes up a company of any kind is the people working on the project, which is why every time I create one of these control centers and by the way, I've created control centers in Airtable for my main business member fix, for our cryptocurrency fund, Blockchain 30, for um, a project that we're doing with our Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu professor called Olavo Abreu Online, and so on and so forth. Everything is always in, in Airtable, and there's a general approach that, that makes sense. And the very first tab, we're going to call it Team. We're going to call it team. And we're going to start, now this, this is called a primary column. And as you can see, it's primary because no matter how many tabs you add to the right, let me show you what I mean here, okay? And no matter how far to the right you scroll, this primary field remains sticky and follows you all the way to the right no matter how many fields you happen to have there. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete these guys. Delete fields, okay. Oops, and let's delete these as well. Field. Let's delete these as well. Okay, so the team member name will in this case be Vic Dorfman, that's me. And let's imagine that I also have a co-founder, and let's say I'll use my friend Leslie, my good friend Leslie Garo, my French friend from Bordeaux, and he's, let's say, my co-founder. Uh, co now what we want to do is we want to indicate the role of the person in the company, generally speaking. So we'll 
create a single line text field, or you can use a single select field, but in case you have an online business where roles are sort of flexible, you want to be able to easily modify this. So I will say founder. Um, and let's say content marketing, which is in fact the role that I will take in the Write Awesome Songs business. And let's say Leslie might be the uh, graphic, or let's say the UX, uh, UI designer, which in fact he is that as well in real life. Any notes you want to include about the team member you would do here? Now, if you want to include things like their hourly rate, so for example, you're going to be working with contractors probably in any business that you're in, if it's online, or even if it's offline. And let's say you have a contractor named, let's say, Peggy Sue. And let's say she's a developer. And let's say you want to indicate that she's, uh, let's say you want to indicate her status. So we're going to insert another field to the right of role, and we will say status. And we will use a single select field. Now, a single select field means that you can only have one option selected at a time, as opposed to a multiple select field, where you can have multiple pre-configured options selected at a time. And we'll say, OK, status would be active, meaning the person is actually working with you. And I'll use green for that. And let's say that they are inactive. And I will use yellow for that. And once you've created those fields, then we can indicate the status. And we can say, OK, all three team members are currently active. Now, if we have another team member, and let's say his name is uh, Naval Ravikant, how cool would that be? And let's say he's an advisor. That would be pretty sweet if you guys know who he is. And let's say that for whatever reason, he's inactive on the project that will indicate that he's inactive. And let's again imagine we've got our friend Tim Ferriss as an investor on the project. And let's say he's inactive. Although I don't know how an advisor or investor could be inactive. It's not like they're contractors. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that that's the case. What we can then start doing is grouping the different team members by their status. OK, so are, are they active or not active? And by the way, what I like to do is I like to squeeze fields to so that they're as small as possible. So in other words, whatever the largest or the longest input is, we want the field to stretch that long, but not longer. We want to keep all of this, we want to economize all of the space so that you're not having to scroll all the way across the screen, and particularly with a with a computer like mine, I have an old MacBook Pro from 2010, you're, you're going to be scrolling a lot with the small screen resolution unless you zoom out, but then you can't see crap. So it's just a good sort of a best practice. And I'll do the same thing for role, and I'll do the same thing for name. OK. So we've grouped by status. And I can see, OK, here are my active team members. Here are my inactive team members. But we will talk more about grouping a little bit later. And we don't really need this attachments field, which kind of comes by default on new tabs. And notes field, we can just indicate stuff like, OK, well, Peggy Sue, we pay her, uh, pay her via Upwork. OK. Or Leslie, we could say 25% um, you know, equity and whatever other information we need to indicate here. And as I said, if you're working with a contractor, and you can indicate that as well, you could say, let's say type. And let's say we'll do another single select, and we'll say full-time, part-time, contractor, advisor, investor, etc. So Vic is obviously would be full time. Let's say Leslie would be a part time designer, x amount of hours per week. Let's say Peggy Sue is 
a contractor, so she, she works on an as-needed basis, on an ad hoc basis. Okay, and my man Naval is going to be, I always want to say Raval Navikant. It's Naval Ravikant, and let's say he's an advisor, an investor, and then that would make the role redundant, right? But it wouldn't make it redundant for the other types of team members. Okay, and let's say we want to indicate their rate, maybe their hourly, hourly rate. Now, here I recommend that you make this a number and not a currency for reasons that will be clear later. But it's basically if you're doing payroll calculations, you want, you don't want to complicate the fields or the cal the calculation by using disparate types of information. So for example, you'll be calculating stuff like hours and you'll be calculating stuff like rate, multiplying them or, or whatever the case may be. You want them all to be of the same field type. Well, it's pretty easy to calculate hours as a number, but you can't calculate hourly rate as hours, minutes, minutes. Does that make sense? So we want to just keep it as a number for now. And let's just just take my word on that. And in fact, we can make it a decimal integer and we could give it a precision of two decimal places or two places after the decimal point. And we could say, okay, Vic's hourly rate uh, would be, let's say, uh, 150, wait, 150 bucks an hour. And Leslie's, let's say, would be 100 bucks an hour. And Peggy Sue, let's say she's, you know, a pretty reasonably priced developer. She charges 35 and Naval would be nothing maybe because he's an advisor and he gets equity and Tim same he's an advisor so he gets equity so he doesn't have an hourly rate so we just leave those blank and now you may be wondering like well if you're using a number for an hourly rate how do you indicate the currency because you might you might not be working with US dollars you may be using Australian dollars or Hong Kong dollars or whatever the case may be or euros and the way that I like to do this again you don't want to hamstring yourself by creating a field and setting a currency and setting a field that then other fields cannot be calculated with in a formula. So what I like to do is, at this point, begin to add field descriptions. So the, the hourly rate or prorated hourly rate, so let's say if somebody has a fixed amount of hours per week or per month, you're not really paying them based based on hours, you're paying them based on the their requirements, but you still want to know what their rate is if, if you prorated it over the course of their required hours. I don't know if that made sense. Hopefully that was clear. Uh, of the team member in US dollars. And you could even just rename the rate field because you have some space here to rate. parenthesis, parentheses, USD. Okay, so now you've got a nice little description as well. And by the way, this is, I think, a really important best practice to get, to get in the habit of doing, which is giving all of your fields in all of your tabs and all of your tabs themselves descriptions that make the purpose of a field and the purpose of a tab impossible to misinterpret by your team members, especially new team members. Okay, so you're basically, in a way, automating having to explain how your control center works to new team members because it's all indicated. You've got tooltips everywhere saying rate, oh, okay, this is the hourly rate or prorated hourly rate of this team member in US dollars. Oh, okay, so now I don't have to bother you the founder or the operations manager, whoever you have in, in, your, in your management team, in, to, like you, they don't have to bother you in Slack to say, oh, well, what does rate mean? It's rate. You know, that kind of thing. So type would be, let's say, uh, edit field description and say, um, the work arrangement type of this team member. Uh, and you could even, say e.g. part-time, full-time, contractor, etc. Okay, so you can give an example of what kinds of values this field can accept.
make it, make it clear that way. And again, let's go ahead and contract this so we're not taking up a ton of space. And let's do the same thing with the rate. Now with, uh, with a field like notes, now this is a long text field right here as opposed to the role field and the name field which are short text fields. And the difference being that if you try to type a bunch of stuff in this field, it all gets put on one line. Okay, so it's meant for short little descriptors, right? But if you want to type out, you know, a bunch of stuff, blah, 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 let's just paste a bunch of random stuff here. You can see that you've got this whole big old blob, big old blob of text that you can, that you can paste into it. And then it also expands. So let's say I paste a bunch of stuff in here. Then I close it. And if I highlight it, if I mouse over it, you can, it can, it has a, a uh, ellipsis indicating that, oh, you can open this bad boy and you, now you can see what's inside. And of course, as with any field where you enter text, namely the short text and long text fields, you can at any of the team members that you've added to the space. And uh, that's also pretty simple to do. You basically just go to share and you either invite people via email or you generate a link and then you send that directly to, to the person that you want to collaborate with. Okay, so this is our team field. Now you can see we've kept it super simple for the sake of time. And let me just consult my cheat sheet here. So we've created our team tab. Now let's go over to customers tab. Now customers tab, obviously every business needs customers. Every, every business has customers. And in fact, rather than recreating the customers tab from scratch, we could even just duplicate this table and we could even duplicate the records. But maybe we'll keep the records um, non-duplicated and we'll rename this table customers. And we'll say, okay, customer name, uh, and let's ungroup here. Okay, and we'll say customer name. Let's say we've got a customer named, uh, who's a cool person, um, Quentin Tarantino, it's pretty cool. Okay, so well, I guess for the customers, we don't really need a role tab, a role field. We could use a status field, like we could say, okay, this customer is either currently paying us or they, they were a previous customer, but now they're inactive. And in fact, we do use this status in the member fix control center for our core business. So I'll say, okay, my man Quinton is active. And any notes about the customer that are important, like um, uh, likes making movies, um, uh, curses a lot. Anything relevant to, to that person can go here. Type, um, probably we can delete that field as well. Rate, we don't need the rate. But what we would need is we would need to indicate what that customer purchased from us and or what subscriptions that they, they are subscribed and subscribed to. And this is probably not as important in a digital products business as it would be in a services business where you need to know which customers are currently active and which aren't. Whereas for a membership site, all of that stuff would be pretty clear in the members dashboard or if you're selling digital products or eBooks might not apply, but I'm going to show it to you anyway and say, uh, um, plan. Okay. So we'll call this one plan and I'm going to leave it as a single line text for now. And you'll see why in a moment. Okay. And, um, any other info you might want to include here about your customers, like maybe how much time they receive. Oh, let's say their website, website, I'll say website one, use a URL. Okay, now we'll duplicate this field. We'll duplicate it yet again. Because you may have a customer and you're working on several of their websites. So we'll say website one, website two. Uh, customize field, rename field, website three. Oh, you'll need their email address, won't you? 
email address. Now this is actually its own field in Airtable, so email. You might need their phone number, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Quentin.tarantino at gmail.com. Wouldn't that be crazy if that's really his email? And let's see their plan. Now I'm going to leave this blank, but I'll come back to it. And let's say https uh, quinton.com https uh, hateful8.com https say reservoirdogs.com dot film. Okay. And so on and so forth, right? Now, why did I leave plan blank? The reason for that is because, and this is a very basic principle of, of organizing your control center or using Airtable in general, you always want to try to separate different categories of information in different tabs. Okay, so in this case, if you have multiple different plans, sure, you could use a single select or a multiple select field and just put what plan they have. But the problem with that is, is that it wouldn't allow you to see any information about that plan. Okay, and you wouldn't want to add all that info in this tab because it would clutter the tab. So what do we do? We create a brand new tab or table. They're called tables, but they look like tabs. And we'll call it, let's say, uh, we can call it plans, but I'm going to call it offers because I want it to include anything that we sell. Anything that you sell is an offer. So whether it's a subscription, a membership, a, a ebook, a physical book, a coaching service, everything should go in one tab because it's one category of information, which is an offer. So offers go here. Okay. And let's say you've got a, um, services subscription. So services plan A. Let's say you've got another services subscription. Let's say you've got a coaching package. Let's say you've got a uh, ebook. Let's say you've got a uh, online course like the one that you're currently in. Let's say you've got a membership site. And let's say you've got a um, say, let's say you've got a an event, a an offline event event. Okay, so all of these different offers um, obviously cost money. Hopefully, you're charging for your stuff. Um, and again, rather than we could use a currency in this case because we probably won't be calculating using the offers tab to do any calculations. And you know, the cool thing is too, so let me show you something. Now let's say we want to say uh, USD. Okay, and let's change, can we change this format? So okay, so we got USD. And this is a currency field now. So we know that um, this one costs, let's say, uh, 97. USD and this one let's say cost 197 USD and coaching package let's say cost 400 USD and your ebook let's say cost uh, $17 your online course is uh, 297 your membership site is 49 a month and your event let's say is 1500 okay let's go ahead and delete this attachments field and we also need to indicate the payment terms right so it's 97 when once every month every quarter every year and what if it's a plan and what if it's only 97 for the first payment and then after that it's something else so you want to indicate all of that stuff and you'll probably want to use a, a long text so that you can add add various descriptions so and by the way you know if you're using a lot of plans in your business this might not be the most elegant way to set this up so as always just leave your comment leave your questions and I can help you and hopefully our, our other members of this community can also chime in and add their ideas and say well here's how we do it and this works really well and 
so on and so forth, because the possibilities are so, so infinite here. And let's say that this is uh, services plan A, let's say monthly. This is the service. And let's say this one is monthly as well. And let's say your coaching package is $400, but it's $200 in two payments, 30 days apart. All right. And your ebook is a one time payment. Your online course is a one time payment. Your membership site is monthly. And if you have several price points, you can, you can indicate that as well. Um, by maybe making, oops, we should call this price, by maybe making like price two tab, price three tab, and so forth. But we're, again, we're going to keep it simple just for the sake of time and demonstration. And your event would be a one-time payment, or maybe there's a plan, plan available. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as I said, if you have a field, let's say you have like a currency field and you and you think, crap, I, you know, I really don't want this to be a currency field. I just want a regular old number field because everything is done in USD in my business, for example. So all you really have to do is you customize the field type. You change it from currency to number. You'd have to set the precision to be two decimal places because currency is two decimal places by default because you've got $1.00. 57 or $1.73, and if you don't include it, it'll just round, it'll just cut off that, that precision point. And you click save. And look what happens. All of your prices have converted to this format. And now all you have to do is indicate price of offer in US dollars. Okay? And then you could even rename this field, say. Price USD. Isn't that cool? But so why the heck did we create this tab anyway? Well, if we go back to our customers tab, we've got this plan field because we want to say which customers are on which plans slash have purchased which offers at different times. And like in our case, we're, we're a services business, so our primary product is just a subscription, straight monthly subscription. And we have three different tiers. We have a light, a mid, and a pro. Well, what I like to do then is I like to customize this field type and make it a linked record. Okay, This is really the most important field in Airtable, arguably, because what it does is it allows you to link information between different tables and to see the relationship between those, those pieces of data and I'll show you exactly what I mean. So we're going to link to another record in another table. And we're going to look up the offers table. And let's open that. And you can see there's a few options here. We can allow linking to multiple records. We could limit the record selection to a particular view, which is a pretty cool feature. But uh, I generally leave this option enabled for the simple reason that, well, in this case, people could buy more, uh, more than one thing. But even if they can't buy more than one thing, you want to leave this option available in case you ever expand your base. In, in, in case you ever need to change stuff around, you'll just have that option available. You don't actually have to utilize it. It's, it'll just be there. So let's go ahead and click Save. OK, cool. So now we have a linked record. And look what happens. When I click this plus, all right, I get a listing of all of the records within the offers table that we created. And if I click on services plan A, you can see that we've got this clickable item here in the plan tab. So what happens when we click it? Look at that. You can see that Airtable indicates, okay, we've just opened a record and we've opened it here in the offers tab, which is why it, there's this linking line going to offers. And we can see all of the data that we entered about that plan in the offers tab directly in this pop-up instead. So we don't actually have to go to offers to view the details of a particular offer. Okay, 
you see we've got the name of the plan, we've got the price of the plan in US dollars, of course. We've got the terms, okay, it's a monthly payment. And we've got the customer with whom this record is associated, in this case, Quentin Tarantino. Now, one thing to notice or to note is that anytime you create a linked tab in, or a linked record in one table, it automatically must create a linked record in the linking table. For the obvious reason that if you're linking from one place, that means that you're reciprocally linking to the other place. Right? So in this case, we've got this customers tab here. So we can see now anytime that we go to the offers tab, well, we know at a glance, and we probably have to expand this tab a bit, all of the customers who are on this particular plan. Right? Or if we want to know all of the customers who are on service plan A, we could also just create a grouping and group by plan. Okay, and that'll group, that'll sort of create blocks um, of different uh, plans. Or we could even create a brand new view and we'll call it services plan A view where we create a filter where the plan name contains, uh, let's say, plan A. Okay. So now we're only going to see records that meet this filter criteria, criterion in this case, right? So that's just a little tasterino of what actually Airtable can do, but again, we're going to try to keep it super, super simple. How are we doing on time? I'm not even actually sure. So I'm just going to keep blasting. I think we started at about 535, if I'm not mistaken. OK, so moving on, we've got our team, we've got our customers, we've got our offers. Our team, customers, our offers. Right, OK, so I wanted to show you a really important concept. And in, in our member fix control center, in our, in our dashboard for for my, uh, our core business, we have two separate tabs. We have a team tab and a customers tab. But really, that kind of violates the principle that I explained to you earlier, which is that you want to keep broad categories of information in one table, okay? And then using the filtering and the sorting and the grouping and the different views, you can create all of those different differentiations within that one tab. So to give you a really simple example, we've got our team here and we've got our customers here. What is the broad category that both team members and customers belong to? They belong to the category of people. They're all people. Well, is there any reason that we can't just have them all in one tab? None at all. So how would we actually do that? Well, okay, so we've got this customer, Quentin Tarantino. So let's go back to the team tab. Now let's rename it the people tab. Okay. And let's add a new record. Let's actually add it to active and we'll say Quentin Tarantino role would be a customer. Okay, but that's actually irrelevant and you'll, you will see why in a second. Any notes, type, rate, etc. Well, we really need to separate who our customers are and who our team members are, right? So what we're going to do is we're simply going to create a brand new view. We're going to create a grid view in this case, and we'll call it the customers view. Okay, and we're going to create another grid view and call it the team members view. And we can yet create another grid and we'll call it the um, strategic partners view and the affiliates view and so on and so forth and what I what I always like to do and I don't know if this is necessarily a best practice this is just a preference of mine is the very first view that you have by default in Airtable in any of your tables I like to keep this ungrouped unfiltered unsorted and rename it as raw raw uh, grid view, no filters. Just to indicate that, look, 
all people, no matter what kind of people they are, whether they're customers, affiliates, partners, team members, whatever, whatever, all go in here and you can see this raw, unfiltered, unsorted view here. And you can see we've got Quentin Tarantino, well, he's a customer and his status is active and type, rate, whatever. But the thing that allows us to sort whether or not somebody is a customer has to be some sort of a field. So type, we need to add another type and we need to say, okay, customer, there's a type. Now what we do is we completely sequester these two fields. So let's go into customers, customer view. And you can see that the customer view doesn't have any filters, groupings, or sortings. So therefore it's exactly the same as this raw grid view because we haven't applied any filters to make it different yet. That's not, that's not what we're gonna do. And customers view, we're gonna add a filter where type and let's say is any of crap what happened there is any of customer because there may be cases where a customer is also an affiliate where a customer is also an investor where customers I guess can also be a team member I don't know but so you want to be careful with your filter and not make it so that it is customer because that would mean customer and only customer but not customer and also something else okay if that makes sense um, so in other words if somebody were your customer and also an affiliate of yours and, and in fact let's add another option called affiliate okay and let's customize this view so that it's no longer single select but multiple select so that we can have multiple types and say, okay, well, Quentin is not only a customer, but he's also an affiliate. So now we can indicate both of those relationships. And when we go uh, create our filter, and you can see we're in the customer's view here, we're going to set the type has any of customer. And there's our filter. So we know Quentin is a, is a customer, and we also know that he's an affiliate. Now, do we need to know his, his uh, hourly rate? Well, he's not a team member, so no, we don't. So what do we do? We right click and we hide that field. Do we need to know whether or not he's active or inactive? I would say, yeah, that's probably a good idea because if you have a services business or maybe this person used to be a, a customer or isn't now, then you, know, you can get rid of them and you could even create a separate status like active for customers and active for affiliates because you wouldn't want to use the same status for both and you would just hide one well, I'll show you instead of explaining it why don't I just show you and I'll just duplicate this field and I'm not gonna yeah I'll duplicate the cells as well so we got two status fields now right and we're gonna rename this status field status customers okay and we'll rename this status status affiliates Well, uh, he's active as a customer, but let's say he's inactive as an affiliate. And I'll show you the significance of that later. And since I don't really need to know his affiliate status in this view, I just need to know his customer status. Well, we will hide this field as well. Okay, and it only hides the field in this view. You see the magic of this? So when we go to the affiliates view, we'll hide his status of whether or not he's active as a customer, but display his status of whether or not he's active as an affiliate. Super cool. So any notes we might have about that customer will enter here. And by the way, any way that you arrange your different fields here within this view will stay like that for that view only. So this view, it's like its own little universe, its own little microcosm of stuff. Okay, cool. So we've got our customer's view. Now let's go to team members view. Okay, well, <clears throat> we need to know what type of uh, person this person is. So we want to indicate, create a new option called team. Okay, I've already indicated full-time, part-time, contractor, advisor, investor, etc. But we need, a more, we need an omnibus, omnibus category that makes it easy to create a filter. Okay, which is what we've just done. Okay, cool. 
So we need to create a new filter where the type has any of the following team. Okay. Now what that implies is that you also have to go back and mark everybody who is a team member with that, with that type. So I'm a team member, Leslie is a team member, Peggy Sue is a team member, Naval Ravikant. I wish it was a team member and Tim Ferriss. I really wish it was a team member too, but hey, Peggy Sue ain't bad either. And now when we go to the team members view, look at that. What do you know? Now we can see that our filtering has worked and these are all of the people that we have. Now, if in this team members view you want to do some further grouping, well, let's just do that. Let's say, well, we want to see who's an active team member and who's an, who's an inactive team member. But look at the problem that we've encountered here. The status tab is for customers. Hmm, but these are all team members. So if we use the status tab for customers to group, um, it's not really going to apply in this case. Although I suppose you can use the same, the same single select field for both cases. But again, what if somebody is a customer, they're active as a customer, but they're inactive as a team member and vice versa, or as an affiliate and vice versa. You want to separate it and create a duplicate field. Okay. And you want to make it clear that this status is for team. And now we just hide the status for customers. And now we have our status for team, which makes it very easy to group according to status for team members. So now we've got all our active team members neatly lined up. We've got all our inactive team members neatly lined up, notes neatly lined up, type. You may not even want to see this information, so you could always just hide it. Status as affiliates, not really relevant for your team, probably, so you hide that. And now you've got a nice clean view that has all the information you want and none of the information you don't want and doesn't interfere with any of your other views. You dig? Now, obviously, when we come back to, the, to this raw view, it's going to be a bit of a mess because we've got all of these different fields. Like we've got two different status fields and we'll probably have more for different types of people and everything. But look what we've effectively done is we've effectively combined the team members tab with the customers tab that we had had and we no longer need this customers tab but we did leave out a few pieces of information that we should probably add so we have website one website two website three plan and email address okay website one two three email address and plan so let's just create those fields and i generally um like to create the fields that the additional fields that I need within the view that I need them in. Okay, so that way it won't actually automatically create that field in the other views. Whereas if you create it in the grid view, um, well, I guess it probably wouldn't transplant that either. No, it wouldn't. So this is another cool feature. So let's say we create website one, and this is a URL field. The question is, is this website one field going to automatically appear in our pre-configured views? And you can see that no, it is not. It is automatically hidden by default, but you can unhide it. How cool is that? So it doesn't automatically assume that, okay, whatever new field you create in one view should be just broadcast to other views. It respects your views. It respects the compartmentalization that you've gone to all this trouble to create. So if we go back to raw grid view here, we can say website one, let's duplicate this guy, website two, uh, duplicate this guy, website three, and we need a linked record. Oh no, excuse me, this is an email address. Email, okay, email. And now we can just copy those four values just like that because we had, or paste them rather, because we had copied them. Okay, now we can just rename these guys. Website three, 
website two, website one, email, and I think we had one more field that we had to insert, which was the plan linked record field that goes to the offers tab. Save it. And now, I definitely pasted this on the wrong line, didn't I? Let's see if we're going to move this down my man Quentin's line. Okay, and now if we open up our customer's view, we see Quentin. We see his notes, if we have any. He likes movies, let's say. His status is active. He's an affiliate and a customer. Now we need to show um, the websites that we work on that are related to him. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Excuse me. We want to show his email and we want to show the plan that he's on. Kidoki. So there you have it. And um, let's see, where did his plan go? Did we not hide that? Unhide that? There we go, plan. Okay. And now we're going to link to the services plan. And again, if you click on on a linked record, it'll pull up that record and indicate which table it's linked to or from. Okie dokie. So what that means essentially is that we can delete this customer's tab and we don't have to have two separate tabs for two separate types of people because they're all under the broad umbrella of being people and we use the different filters and different views to, to um, manipulate that information within the same table. Okay, and this is really important because unlike something like Google Sheets, and you probably know this or otherwise you wouldn't be watching this, it allows us to prevent duplication of data. It allows us to prevent having redundant entries in our database, and it allows you to have fewer places to put stuff. So if you have you know, a tab for team, a tab for customers, a tab for affiliates, you're, you have to recreate a bunch of different stuff and it also limits your ability to just create filters out of an existing dump of a bunch of different data okay within one table so that's the reason we do that so we've got our people we've got our offers all right and we are really cracking along on time here so we should probably speed things up so calls uh, or you could be watching this at 1.5x or 2x or 1.75x speed as well unless you think I'm talking too fast in which case you could probably slow it down anyway calls why would you need a calls tab for your business well in our in the business that I'll be creating and you know by the way I meant to I meant to make this like a real dashboard that I'm really going to be using but I guess the truth is that I really don't know who's going to be on my team at this point, and it's not going to be any of these people, um, except Vic and possibly Leslie, um, and possibly Naval Ravikant as well. Who knows? Um, and I don't really know what my offers are going to be yet, so I had to create some sample data. So I need you to suspend disbelief a little bit and say that, hey, Vic, I thought you were going to use this for a real business. Well, I will, but I'm going to change all this stuff to reflect the actual offers that I come up with but I have to come up with them first, right? Now calls. <clears throat> in pretty much any kind of online business and in a lot of offline businesses, you do all sorts of calls. You do calls with vendors, you do calls with prospective customers who want to sign up and they want to ask you some questions. With You do coaching calls, you do um, interviews for, for podcasts and for websites. Any kind of a call, you should have it recorded. You should have a recording of it. We use Zoom for, for all of our calls, which is fantastic. Just blows Skype right out of the water, uh, which is spyware anyway. Google it if you don't believe me. Or DuckDuckGo it if you're, really, if you're really cool. And that's what we have this tab for. So now, in this case, we don't need the name to be the primary field. We really need it to be a date. because and. So the rule of, of, of primary fields is 
what is the organizing piece of data that defines all of the items in a particular category of information. That's kind of a mouthful, but in this case, let's say, okay, we've got the date. The only thing that really distinguishes all of these calls is when they're made. And it's probably kind of the most, the easiest way to sort and filter the different, different calls. So we'll say, we'll say date. Uh, we will not include a time field because it's probably not relevant, although you could include a time field if you wanted to. And I'll just say save. I will rename it as the date. So this is the date the call is taking place, right? Now, we want to indicate who we're making the call with. Okay, so that will be caller on the team. Okay. And we will create a duplicate field called caller. Uh, in fact, you know what? Here's what we'll do. We'll just do caller one. Caller one. And caller two. And we'll make both of these. What kind of record do you reckon we need here? Who do we have calls with? Do we have them with people? Yes, we have them with people. So we're going to use people, a linked record from people. And we do allow linking to multiple records because sometimes you have calls with multiple people. And we will say caller one is from people. Caller two would also have to be from people because you're, unless you're having calls with AI or something, which is probably a thing by now. Um, then you're going to be calling from one people's to another people. And uh, what we'll do is we'll say, OK, Vic has a call with Leslie on uh, Friday the 28th. And what I like to do for calls, and this is just, again, my preference, we'll say um, agenda. Actually, agenda, say purpose, not agenda, purpose. So we want a really brief description. Um, discuss website design, okay? And then this becomes the agenda. And I really try to come into calls with an agenda, especially if they're calls with friends or, or people I'm friendly with, because they tend to sort of get out of control and you just get way off course and you're not being productive. You're just kind of chit-chatting with another, which is fine, but it's just not really the time or place. So what you would do is you say, one, um, show Leslie websites I'd like to model, um, show Leslie a list of functionality, let's say uh, send Leslie, send and demo a list of functionality we need along with due dates, um, let's say discuss timelines and appoint due dates. And let's say for um, discuss plugins we need. And five, let's say decide on hourly rate to pay Leslie, if that's relevant. And so we have the agenda, and it makes it really easy to just go through each of these items when you're actually on the call to pull up this field. And um, one convention that I use is I use these two brackets. OK, and this again, this is personal preference. You do not have to use this at all. But if you use these brackets, what it allows you to do is, OK, you're, you're on the call. You've shown Leslie the websites you'd like to model. Task done. You send it and demo a list of functionality that we need along with due dates. Oh, OK, that's done. Discuss timelines. OK, we're done with that. Discuss the plugins we need, yada, yada. We did that. And decide on an hourly rate. And you can even add some call notes here. Or you could even set, you could keep that as a separate tab. Um, but that might just get a little bit cumbersome because you'd be opening this val uh, this um, cell and you'd be opening the other cell as well. So you could just sort of make it a combined field if you want and say notes call. But again, up to you. And any attachments, I, I don't really think calls will have attachments, but what they probably will have and what I certainly recommend you do is record all of your calls and upload them somewhere.
So you could upload them to uh, Dropbox. Uh, you, you could even upload them directly to Airtable, but <clears throat> Airtable isn't really meant for, for, for file storage. So I just use a URL and I plug in the URL from, from Google Drive when it becomes available. And in fact, we actually have a Zapier Zap so that whenever a file is uploaded to our calls folder in Google Drive, it automatically sends the URL to here along with a little bit of info and the, the way that we're able to identify the like who the caller is and the date and so forth is because we have a naming convention for like before we upload before we upload the call to Google Drive we name it a certain way like let's say it would be something like um, today is June 27th so it'd be 6 27 19 so that's the first part of the convention with a uh, pipe which is the second part of the convention and we'll say uh, Vic Dorfman okay so that's the caller say Leslie Garot that's the callee and the say discuss website design the purpose Okay, and you could even have Zapier parse your convention and automatically put each of these fields in the appropriate place. Like the date would get parsed and go to the date uh, field. The caller would get parsed and go to the caller field. The, the other caller would get parsed and go to the second caller field. And the purpose would get parsed and go to the purpose field. And the recording URL would automatically be sent there as well. So there's so much cool stuff you could do out of the box with Airtable, but we're really only scratching the surface because there's Zapier. And there, there's also direct API integrations. If, if you have a developer on your team, you could just go absolutely crazy, which you might do that now that you're, now that you're getting the hang of it. OK, moving right along, we've got our calls. We need, we need tasks. We need tasks because you know, the thing with a business is you got to do stuff. So we need to have a way to track that stuff. And I'm not going to go too in-depth into this in this video because A, we're already kind of long on time, and B, because it, it deserves its own set of videos about how you really track tasks. But suffice it to say that you want to indicate what the task is, one, two, three, you want to obviously include any important information about that task, you know, or maybe even some action steps. Do A, do B, and do C. And you also need to indicate who is the owner of the task. Because, uh, and that's a linked record, and that'll go to people. Okay, and I like to call this field owner because it implies ownership <clears throat> rather than um, whatever the opposite of ownership is, disownership. And we also want to set due dates. We want to set due dates. Okay, and due dates are generally going to utilize a date field. Okay, now this is the grid view. Again, raw unfiltered view. Raw grid view, no filters. As always, that's my first view that I create, but it's not really conducive to doing task stuff, but you know what is super conducive to doing tasks is the Kanban view. Oh, the Kanban view. So this is just like Trello. This essentially is the same thing as Trello, but without having to use or pay for Trello and go into a separate app. Now, actually, I have to go back to the raw grid view and create one more field type with which, around which, to organize the Kanban view because you see Kanban view is a series of cards, right? You usually have tasks to be done, so un like maybe unassigned, you, you could call it unassigned, tasks in progress, completed tasks. And you might have something like rejected tasks, archived, or whatever categories you want. And we'll say status. It's going to be a single select field. 
in this case it has to be single select, and we'll say planned, in progress, completed, rejected. So maybe that's a task you wanted to do, but then you decided, ah, it's kind of not really super important. And we'll say those are our statuses, right? Okay, so let's just create a few more tasks so you can see how this works. So we got task one, two, three, task one, two, three. So now we've got three distinct tasks, okay? And let's say Vic is the owner of one, Leslie is the owner of the other, and let's say Vic is the owner of the third task as well, okay? We set our due dates. Okay, we set our due dates here. And for the status, we are going to indicate that this task is planned, this task has been completed, and this task by Leslie is in progress. Okay, now how would this look in the Kanban view? Well, you can see that it's asking you which single select or collaborator field would you like to use for this Kanban view. Your records will be stacked based on this field. So we're going to use the status field. And um, by default, Airtable adds this uncategorized status. Okay, so all you have to do is click Collapse Stack, and it collapses that, that status. And it will remain collapsed for this view, because again, anything you do within a view stays that way unless acted upon by an outside force, so to speak. So we've got planned, in progress, completed, rejected, and that's it. But we don't really know who this belongs to, so what we have to do is we have to determine or define the cards or customize the cards. So we want to see who the owner is. Aha, there is the owner. Okay, so we can see the owner and we want to see the due date too. Okay, so now we know when it's due, we can see the owner and we can see what, what all needs to be done. Okay, and if we want to go further and say, okay, well, let's make a Kanban view, we'll duplicate this view, where it's only VIX stuff, so VIX Kanban view, and I don't, I don't, because you don't want your team members to have to see other team members' tasks necessarily, right? You, you, that's that's just too much signal to no, to noise, too little signal to noise ratio, I guess, too low of a sig signal to noise ratio, and we'll create a filter where the name is, uh, or let's say contains. Because if, if you put is, it has to be exactly the, the value. So we'll just say uh, Dorfman. Because nobody else is going to have Dorfman. And hey, wait a minute. Let's say Vic. Oh, where owner, not name, where owner contains Vic. There we go. Cool. So now I just see what I need to do. So anytime I, I need to check my tasks, I'll go into tasks. I'll go to Vic's Kanban view. And I've got everything I need. So again, keeping this really high level, not going to go into too much detail here, because again, this is, this is going pretty long. So let's move right along. And don't worry, I know I've got a lot of items here. I'm not going to address all of those because it's just going to take way too long. Now, one thing I didn't get into, but that I will get into in the, in the lessons, I can talk, in the lesson specifically about how to create your task tables, what you can do, and what I, what I actually started doing, is you can create a parent task table, and you can create a child tasks table, the function of which is to allow you to track projects, rather than having a, sort of a combination of little tasks. And I won't get into it now, but it's a, it's a pretty cool little workaround. Okay, timesheet. Um, in, in our company, in MemberFix, we always track time for everything. And one of the reasons we do that is because when we're doing, if our customer needs to see what work we're doing for them, they have their own reporting view. Okay, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. That's number one. Number two, we just need to know where our time is going. 
You know, you, you need to know how your team is using their time. You need to know how you're using your time to determine whether or not you're being effective. And, uh, you know, nobody really likes tracking time, but it's one of those things that uh, you, know, you kind of, you know, have to learn like as a business owner, I think. So that's my view. Unless you have KPIs that, that, uh, that aren't really dependent on, on time tracking, but in a services-based business, you kind of need to do it. So anyway, here's a timesheet. And what I always do is I make this first field, this primary field, a long text field. Okay, now we'll rename this one task, and we'll say, all right, this is an itemized list of all the stuff that I've done in service of this task. So let's say I'm, right now I'm working on this control center, so one, I, um, I hit record in ScreenFlow, then I created a demo control center, Three, I will let's say edit the screen flow screen no 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 screen flow video well, that was my niece sorry about that uh, hit record in screen flow hit record in screen flow create a demo control center edited the screen flow video and four I will export the video at night as a bulk export going to take a while on my Mac. And so there's your task. And so you have an itemized view of the task. Now we also need to indicate the actual time that we spent working on it. So that means we've got to create a new field. And this is going to be a date field. And it is going to include a time field in this case. Okay. And you can choose to use the same time zone for all collaborators. Probably a good idea so that it's just not confusing to anybody. So okay. And we'll call this the start time field. And we're going to duplicate it. And we're going to call it the end time field. And then what we want to do is we want to create a new field, which is the total duration. OK, and this is going to be a uh, duration field. And the format is hour, colon, minute, minute. So uh, we started this around 5.30, I reckon, about 5.30. So if we were to wrap things up now, that would put us at 1 hour and 10 minutes. So you've got your duration. And you can see here at the bottom that we can, and this is also beyond the scope of this particular master class. This is just an overview, is we can sum the values in a column, or we can create a histogram, define a, not define, but view a range, see the min, max, median, and all sorts of cool operations that apply to numbers and durations and so forth. Okay, and of course, we need to indicate who actually worked on this task, or who, who made the timesheet entry, rather. And we could link to the record of people. And if you want, you could also say link to task. But I, I find that if you do too much linking, it becomes sort of cumbersome. So we try to keep it simple. Okay. Now, in practice, what I do is I have a timesheet tab. Oh, sorry. By the way, I forgot. We need to also add the customer for whom we're doing the work. And if you're doing the work for your own company and not for a customer per se, then what you simply do is you create a new record, okay, and we're going to call it Write Awesome Songs. That's the name of my, my new project, and we'll, we'll put in parentheses company to indicate that we're doing work for the company, right, and not for a particular customer. Um, and say uh, the, the role, it's the, it's the company. <laughs> the status is a customer, it's obviously active. Notes, uh, no, part-time, full-time, whatever, doesn't matter. Rate, doesn't matter. Status, doesn't matter. Uh, none of that stuff is relevant. All that's relevant is that we're able to see how much time each team member spends working on a particular task 
for the business. And we can also see if we do have customers, let's say if we're getting commissions for writing songs or whatever the case may be, then we can also see, okay, well, we spent 14 hours writing the song for, you know, so-and-so, some Russian oligarch or whatever the case may be, who I would charge a lot of money to. Okay, and the owner, let's say in this case, is Victor. And looky, looky here. So I actually have my first timesheet entry. And I'm going to remove these so that I can accurately represent how much time I've been spending on this uh, video. Um, even though this is a little bit complex because on the one hand, I'm working on creating the control center for Write Awesome Songs. On the other hand, I'm working on this master class. So how do, is it a duplicate time entry? Um, or how would you determine that? I don't know. Honestly, um, I would probably just enter it into both um, both control centers, both for this one and for, for the other business. Um, and in the, in the lesson that I have about timesheets, I'm going to show you how you can actually break this up into two tabs and have an in-progress timesheet and an actual uh, completed timesheet and how those are two different tabs and why that makes sense. Why would you, why would you do that? will be made abundantly clear to you. Okay, timesheet is done. Okay, let's take a quick look at schedule. Schedule is really important. So schedule is you need to know when your team is working. Excuse me. You need to know when your team is working. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a calendar view. Okay. And we'll say date. Okay. And there's our calendar. Now we've got our calendar view, but we need to connect the calendar view or we need to indicate, okay, we know people are working on such and such a date, but we need to know who is working on such and such a date, which means we need we need a linked record that goes back to the people table. Okay, so we know so-and-so is working on such and such a date. And let's say, like in our business, we have different types of days. We have, we have uh, content days. So these are days where our team members focus solely on writing content, the content that, the content that they're responsible for. We have uh, free days. We have buffer days. And we have focus days. Now those mainly apply to me. And if, you've, if you're familiar with Strategic Coach, you'll You'll understand why that's the case. And we have, um, actually we're going to, yeah, content days, free days. So actually we're going to change this a little bit and we're going to say content days, so that's a working day. Working, regular off, paid off. Okay, so this is the way we actually use it in real life. And I'll explain what that means. So. And let's rename that, remember, and let's go back to our calendar view. So here's the 27th, this is today. Let's create an entry. And let's say um, name will be XYZ, I don't know. And the type of day is a working day. And who is actually working? Vic is working, okay. Now you can see that this is this name field is not a great organizing field. It's not a great organizing field. So let's go back to our grid view and let's customize this field type. Now you can see that the primary field in Airtable does not give you all the options. Like you can't use the linked record to be your primary field. You can't use like a roll up field. There are certain fields that, that don't apply, but the date field seems like the most logical organizing field for for a calendar for a scheduler so we're going to make this date we're going to copy this over here and we're going to delete this second date field and we're going to rename this date so now when we open our calendar
we can see we can see the date, the type, working, not working, etc. And in fact, you know what? Let me go over to our schedule here in our real business to see what organizing field we use. Because I think it's a little bit different. So here's our raw view, no filters. Ah, okay, so we did something a little bit different. You can see that, in fact, the organizing field, and I'll give you guys this template, of course, but just to show you, um, we actually use a function field because we need to collate or concatenate, I believe, is the actual function. Um, here, you can actually see this. It's, uh, yeah, it's a concatenation function, I think, where it takes the first name of the team member, hyphenates, and then also indicates the status, like are they working, are they off, or are they on a content day, or what. And then that becomes the primary field, which makes it really super easy just to view at a glance, see, oh, okay, today CS is off, Stan is working, Victor is working, Ardian is working, Radu is working, I'm working, Soren is working, cool. And it also makes it easy for me to see, okay, who's on a paid day off? We can see CS is on vacation. So cool, hope he's enjoying that right now. And so there's all this kind of cool stuff that we're going to get into. But again, this is just an overview. So let's move right along. Finish this bad boy up, because you're probably getting a bit antsy. No, I am. OK, back to our outline. OK, so we did our timesheet. We've done our schedule. Let's take a quick look at content marketing stuff, because this is really important. And what we're going to do is we're going to create content. And again, this is somewhere where I kind of messed up inside of our member fix control center because we, you can see here we've got content articles and content videos. Now those are both types of content, so they should really be in one tab. So those, those need to be joined together. And what I'll do here is I'll say content. It'll be, let's say, the name of the content piece, like how to write a chord progression. Then it will indicate the type of content it is. Now it could be two different types of content, right? It could be, so we'll do a multiple select and then we'll say, okay, well, it's um, actually in this case, we'll probably want to make a single select. And we'll say uh, type, okay, article, video, audio. Uh, I don't know what else, maybe. I think those are the main types, right? And this will be an article. And we'll say, you know, any, any kind of a content marketing plan requires that you have some due dates and some KPIs around how many pieces of content you produce every month and so forth. And I'll say we have a due date field here. Again, we'll want to rename it, do, and set a due date. Okay. And there's a lot of other stuff that you can configure here. And you can use views to sort of create your quarterly article KPIs and video KPIs. You can indicate where the articles are posted if you're doing guest posts, where it's actually published. So that's usually um, something that you want to indicate in all cases. It's kind of a universal, so we'll go ahead and include that. Yeah, by the way, you know, sometimes, I don't know, I find myself scrolling through this thing, especially if I'm tired, I'm just not seeing the field. You just type it in, and it'll, it'll bring it up. Okay, and we'll say HTTPS, writeawesomesongs.com slash write chord progression. And we got our nice SEO-friendly URL. Okay, and you could also really plan your articles here as well, like what is your actual idea? So description. And you can flesh out your description of your of your piece of content that you're going to have. Okay, we want to do a seven part post or seven step post on how to write a chord progression. Okay, say so that'll be the first point, second point, videos with each point. 
um, required word count equals let's say 2,000 words. I like I like to write long articles, and you could even make word count one of these fields, right? And so on and so forth. And this you would do exactly the same thing for a video, but again, just like we did with the uh, people tab or table is you would create different views for the articles and for the videos and for the audios because you would have a little bit of a different field, right? Like you wouldn't have, uh, well, I guess really in, in some cases it'd be the same, but you, you'd probably wind up with some different fields that apply to one view but don't apply to another view. And maybe this one is how to create a groove. Okay, and um, maybe I need some sort of, uh, I need to sort of, uh, what's the word storyboard the video because video you got to you got to storyboard a video sometimes so okay storyboarding you got your storyboard stuff and that could be a separate field right it could be a long long text field and you've got your um you know your equipment field or whatever the case may be for video i'm not really a video guy but i guess i will have to become one here in the next few years and get better at it so that's our content tab by the way I haven't added description descriptions to any of these yet. So, um, table tracking and let's say table tracking and defining all of our content marketing efforts. That's a bit verbose, but anyway, just to let you know that that is how you add a description to a table. Okay, we are getting to the end of it, more or less, because I'm not going to go over all of these. You can bet your fern. I'm not going to do that. Now, partners, I will go ahead and skip that for now because I did, um, I, I did sort of go into it in the introduction, introductory video of how that works with our member fix uh, control center. But it's basically, uh, again, you wouldn't even really need this as a separate field or as a separate table, this would be part of people. These partners are people too. And affiliates are people too. So these could all be combined into the people tab. I'm not even really sure why we, we keep creating new tabs. Sometimes you just get lazy, I guess, and you just feel like it's going to be easier, easier to create a new tab. But at the end of the day, it really isn't. At the end of the day, you want to keep your categorization uh, where where you had set it originally because that's the whole point of Airtable is categorizing. Now SOPs, I did also go over this in the intro video, um, so I'm not going to get into it here, but I will say that you should have standard operating procedures regardless of your business. This is sort of a passion project business. There's going to be a lot of multimedia, a lot of blogs, a lot of video, a, you know, a lot of music stuff. But it's still a business, so you still need your standard operating procedures. You still need them. You know, so we've got our, our member fix SOPs here, and we've got them organized by view for different roles in the company. You could see who what the SOP is, who wrote it, its status, its type, is it a document, is it is it a video, is it a gravity form? Because we actually create executable SOPs via gravity forms. Maybe I'll make a video on that because that's kind of a cool thingy the different roles that this SOP may pertain to, the URL of the SOP, any tags. And the tags, this is a cool little feature. It basically just makes it really easy to search, right? Because you just you just look for a tag. Like, oh man, where's that SOP about Freshdesk, about how you do the thing in Freshdesk? Oh, I know, why don't I just create a filter where the tag has any of Freshdesk. And there's all of our SOPs that have anything to do with fresh stuff. Okay. And we've also got a field indicating whether or not we've created a gravity form out of it. The URL for the checklist, is it specific to a customer? Yes or no? Because we also create customer specific SOPs. So I'm not going to get into that here, but you absolutely should um, create an SOPs tab and I'll, I'll get into that in a separate lesson as well. Because this is again just a master class of sorts, a primer, let's say, it's a kind of Airtable for Business 101. SOPs, payroll. 
way beyond the scope of this video. This this deserves its own lesson and will get its own lesson. It's pretty complicated, but um, and again, I covered it in the intro video, but suffice it to say that if you have any team members that are on contract, that you pay hourly or per project, it's a really good idea to track all of that stuff and have a record of it. You may already have a way of doing this, like maybe you use a Xero, some kind of accounting software, QuickBooks. Maybe everything is going through PayPal, whatever the case may be. We like Airtable, so that's where we keep our payroll info, but um, we're not going to actually create that table in this demo base. <clears throat> course outlines. So this is, um, I just threw this in for fun, but basically this is what you're looking at. You're looking at the course outlines table, and what this relates to, and I covered this in the intro as well, is this knowledge products tab. So if you're selling any kind of, or this, this could even be offers, right? This could even be combined with offers and, and separated by type. I might do exactly that. So it, it's interesting too, making this video, I really kind of see where I tripped up and where I could have done a better job of, of um, making our control center for our main business more effective than it is sort of reducing the amount of tabs that we have at any, at any given time. And so we've got our knowledge products listed here. Okay, those would really just be different kinds of offers. And then we've got course outlines, and I'm not even really sure that Airtable is the best choice for this, but since everything is already in Airtable, why not just use Airtable to do the outline of this knowledge product, which you are currently consuming and watching. So that's exactly what I did, and that's exactly where we are at. So, and the course outlines is really simple. You're basically just um, creating a chapter, which is a single, single line field, and a notes field, which is a long text field. And you're grouping by a linked record, which links back to whatever product this chapter is related to. So if I had a different product, let's say I had a product, or let's say I've got my ebook, okay, chapter one, introduction, and then I'll have my notes uh, mention so and so, thank my dad, daddy, shout out to little JJ. Joking, but basically, um, you can see. So, okay, cool. So now we've got all of our chapter or course outlines for this product grouped here, and for this product, it's grouped here. And we can even hide this field, and it was hidden before, right? And bada bing, bada boom, we've got our course outlines. And you know, you don't even really have to keep this tab once you've used it. This could be sort of a temporary tab because. Once the product is created, do you really need to hold on to the outline? Maybe, maybe not, it's up to you. It'd be pretty cool if you could actually archive entire tables or hide entire tables. Maybe that will come in the future, but for now, you can't do that. Okay, we've got our course outlines and CRM. Now I covered this a little bit in the introduction and I obviously will have a separate, a separate lesson on CRM. But this depends entirely on the kind of business you run. So with Write Awesome Songs, for example, we're not really going to need a CRM to, to acquire customers because we won't be doing outbound marketing for our membership, I don't think. But we may need a way to, let's say, track our affiliates or our strategic partners. So a lot of times in, in a creative field like music or art or whatever the case may be, you have um, people who come in who are sort of subject matter experts. So me, I'm like a guitar songwriting guy, but maybe there's this really good piano songwriting guy and we say, hey, I'll give you 50% of all of this sales, you know, however you track it, of like every anybody who buys your master class on piano songwriting, you'll get half of those sales and we'll get more content and more members hopefully and so on and so forth. Well, we need a way to track that relationship. And of course, it would link back to the people tab using a linked record as always. 
and you'd be able to track the progress of your relationship um, just like you would in Pipedrive or any other CRM. And that's exactly what we started to do here. Okay, in MemberFix, we started to say, okay, let's reach out to various partners, various, I keep saying various, let's reach out to various partners and, and see if they can list us as a qualified contractor because that's in fact how we get a lot of our business is through various uh, membership plugins and themes and services and so forth that list us as a service provider. They may not endorse us uh, officially, some of them do, but at least they're linking to us and giving us a source of free leads, traffic, and SEO. Not a bad deal, really. So that is, in a, in a very broad, simplistic way, how the CRM would, would work, look, and function. Now, we'll get into the actual logistics of how to set it up in a separate video. Okay, so we are just about done here, and I think we're going on maybe almost two hours already. Okay. So CRM, all done. <clears throat> KPIs, well, again, this is super, super business specific, depending on your particular business, what your KPIs are and how you track them. You might not even need a separate table for that. Or you might. Because what if your KPIs are just content? Well, in that case, you just create a new view in your content tab. But maybe your KPIs are sales or leads or whatever. You would, want, you would want to track those in a separate tab, but we actually don't have our KPIs. We have our KPIs defined, but we don't have them defined in Airtable for, for MemberFix. So I'm not going to get into that either. And I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm sort of abridging the end of this, but I did intentionally leave these more complicated tables for the end because I, I wanted to touch on the fundamentals of how to set up this control center. And then later on, you can look at the different lessons and set up what you need so that you're not sort of forced to watch something that doesn't apply to you. Okay, so KPIs, we'll have that. Knowledge products, so again, this could be, this could be concatenated. All right, and KPIs, that's sorted. Feedback, testimonials. Really, feedback and testimonials could be the same table because a testimonial is a sort of feedback. A, a negative critique from a customer is a sort of feedback. So is a positive critique. So any kind of uh, feedback you're getting from customers, from members, and so on and so forth, you could put in a feedback tab. And, and I, I actually find this to be a really useful table. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put feedback. Okay, this will be the actual feedback. This will be like a short description call it uh, over overview maybe like you guys suck just kind of in specific and or unspecific or maybe it would be something really specific like um, I love your video on CRMs or actually on songwriting because this is the songwriting base right you guys suck I probably wouldn't put that in there because that's not, that's not actionable feedback. I guess if enough people are saying you suck, then you pay attention, but you can't really do anything with you guys suck, right? And then the sort of long version of the feedback, maybe the type. Okay, is it a, uh, is it a testimonial? Is it a critique? Is it member feedback? Etc. and so on and so forth. Okay, so I love your video on songwriting, so that could be like a member feedback. And we could even say like format, did they send a video? I always go for video testimonials because the way I look at it is if you ask your members or your customers for a video testimonial and they're camera shy and they say, oh, I'm not doing that. You say, okay, well, could you do a uh, text testimonial please and can I use your picture? You're kind of down, I guess you're, you're, you're downselling them, basically. Because if they do the video testimonial, great, you get the best possible type of testimonial. If they don't do it, well, maybe they won't feel so intimidated to do a text testimonial, and then maybe they'll be more likely to say yes than if you had just requested the text testimonial. So that's my thought process. I don't really know if that's 
really true, but that seems to be the case. Uh, format would be video, text, audio, in person, say. Okay, and let's say somebody, let's say somebody sent me a video saying, Vic, you're, I love your video on songwriting, it's really great, and in that case, we probably wouldn't need this text. We'd probably just want a URL of the video. Okay, and if we, again, if we wanted to organize these into different views where we have all of our member feedback in one view, all of our testimonials in another, in another view, getting tired, all of our um, critiques in yet another view, way down at the bottom, so you don't have to cry yourself to sleep when you see them, um, then you could do that. So feedback and testimonials and resources, to be honest, and I covered this in, a, in the intro as well, I don't really use the resources table very much, but I think when it comes time to really get cracking on the Write Awesome Songs project, it will actually be really useful because there will be, and, and you know resources isn't really a great name, I would say um, materials or collateral, say materials, and we actually did use this tab quite a lot in our cryptocurrency fund, Blockchain 30, which we ran exactly like I just showed you guys, exactly like this, this is how we ran it, is this control center format, and it was obviously had some very specific tabs and so on and so forth, but it's all the same principles regardless of the actual business. So whether it's like a songwriting business, a services business like member fix, whether it's an offline business, real estate, doesn't matter. As long as you understand the, the conceptual and, and, and foundational framework of how all of these different tables interact, how to organize them, you'll be able to do pretty much everything. And I'm betting if you've watched all the way through, uh, well, first of all, Congratulations for, for, for stomaching me for that long. I, I, I can barely listen to myself speak at this point. But secondly, you probably already have some idea of how you can organize your, your control center based on just one what I've told you without deep diving on any of the particular tables and, and their particular particularities. All right, so but anyway, final tab here. Materials would be something like name of the material. So, in the songwriting world, I'd probably have a lot of quizzes, PDFs. Let's say, uh, how to write a catchy melody. Okay, melody. And we'll say, insert write resource type. It will be a, maybe a single select, and we'll say it's a PDF. Might be a PDF, might be a video, might be an article, might be an ebook. I guess ebook and PDF is really the same thing as an ebook. Might be a white white paper. Um, could be a quiz. Uh, there's just so many ways. It could be an email email course, email mini course. So many ways that you can package your your goodies. And let's say this is a video. Okay, and maybe I uh, I can upload it as an attachment, or I could link to it via the URL, wherever it may happen to be, and just have all of these uh, materials ready and available sort of in one place. You might, you'll probably have them in Dropbox or Google Drive, but they're, they're, they're notated here, so you don't have to actually go to Google Drive to get the URL, you see, or to link people to it, which is obviously super, super useful. And once again, you could organize by resource type, whether it's a video, a document, an article, or, or what have you. So, guys, first of all, thank you for sticking with me through this master class. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to break this up into too many lessons because I didn't want it to be fragmented. This is sort of a holistic, you need to see it all at once kind of thing. This is all, almost like a coaching call. And since it's gone about two hours, almost two hours, if it had been a coaching call, it probably would have run you about 300 bucks because my rate is $150 an hour for this type of a coaching. So hopefully you've kind of already recouped your investment and, and hopefully you see the value of what this, this can bring to your business in terms of organization, in terms of 
not having to pay for other apps that do stuff that you can do with Airtable in terms of getting your team all in one place. I mean, for MemberFix, uh, if, if, if we could find a way to do chat on, Air, on Airtable, we probably would get rid of Slack. But unfortunately, you know, Slack is sort of, chat is too different from, from the functions that Airtable offers. But we even thought, true story, we even thought about getting rid of Freshdesk which is our ticketing system, and creating sort of a Frankenstein ticketing system using Airtable because Freshdesk doesn't really have everything that we want in a ticketing system. No ticketing system has everything we want in a ticketing system. So we thought, ah, maybe we'll build our own and maybe Airtable will sort of... Anyway, point being that we we're, whereas we used to use seven or eight different apps, now we just use Airtable, Slack, and Freshdesk. Mostly, mostly Airtable. So... Um, guys, I know this has been a big, long, verbose uh, video. If you have any questions, if you need any clarification, if you need me to address a particular issue that I haven't addressed here or in any of the satellite lessons that deep dive on each of these individual tables, okay, leave your comment, leave your questions below. Let's discuss it. Let's figure it out and let's make this... Um, not just theoretically valuable to you in your business, let's, let's, let's actually implement it and make it of practical value so that you get your money's worth and then I get to put you in my sexy testimonials tab in the MemberFix Control Center. So thanks a lot guys, welcome again to the, to the MemberFix, the, the Airtable by example knowledge product business edition. And I will see you guys around the comments and in the forums. Ciao.